Yep. Right. Okay. Um, thanks, Jason. Th thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me come along tonight. Um, ho hopefully, this will be a good talk. Um, I've revamped it a bit this week to include some .NET 5 and C Sharp 9 bits and bobs. So um, if, I, if I lose my thread a bit, apologies. It's been a bit of a sort of last minute revamp this week. So with that said, if I can get my clicker working. Here we go. So for those who don't already know me, I'm Steve Collins. I've been programming in one form or another since the early 80s, but professionally I've been doing it since, well, the early 90s with VB3, then moving on to .NET in the noughties. Um, I can be found at Steve Talks Code on Twitter, and also that's the domain of my blog. Um, so with that done, let's get started. Now I've called this the booster jab because, well, I quite like terrible puns, even in the middle of a pandemic, so it's not great, but there you go. Um, but I'm also calling that because I'm making the assumption that everyone coming along already has a basic understanding of dependency injection. Some of what I'll be describing in this talk, you may well already know, but hopefully I'll be revealing a few new golden nuggets that may be new to you. So before we go any further, I want to apologize to any purists watching that I'll be more than likely to get the terms dependency injection and inversion of control muddled up and swap them round, but I'll try and use the right terms in the right places. But as a baseline, let's start by clarifying what they actually are. Inversion of control is the generic term for relying on something being provided to us rather than creating it ourselves. So if you've got a class, rather than doing new left, right and center all over the place, you accept those things coming into you. Dependency injection is the form of IOC where the external implementations are applied through constructors or method parameters, but there are other ways as well. You can have IOC without dependency injection. Think about the template pattern or strategy patterns, where you have a base class that relies on an inheriting class to provide some form of functionality. So you've got an abstract class that sort of says you must implement this and so on and so on. When the two terms become interchangeable, where it comes to the controlling framework where DI container and IOC container tend to both refer to a framework responsible for creating those implementations based on definitions that are expressed through code or configuration. Different implementations do it different ways. It used to be old school things that with XML files. Now we tend to do it in code in startup classes. So in this talk, I'll usually refer to a DI container when I'm talking about the Microsoft service provider implementation, because this is all about .NET in this one. With that in mind, here are some assumptions that I'm making before we carry on. First is that most of you will be using a host builder of one flavor or another to create the DI container. Now it's outside the scope of this talk, but if you're moving from ASP.NET Core 2 to 3, or in a couple of weeks time, 5, there's a number of differences in the signatures used in the startup class. The main one of which is that whilst we continue to use the configure services method to register services, we no longer use the build service provider at the end to return a service provider. Other changes include limitations in what you can inject to a startup constructor. It's very constrained pretty much down to configuration and logging bits and bobs like that. If you want to get an understanding of what's changed between the various versions, recommend looking at Andrew Locke's blog post, and I've got the link there. Before we started, I posted all the links into chat, but I can post them again at the end. So don't, don't worry about sort of trying to grab these as, as we go. So this talk focuses on addressing some of the nuances and shortcomings of Microsoft's implementation of the DI container. First thing to know is it's a conforming container. Now, I've borrowed that phrase from Mark Seaman, who's written an awful lot about dependency injection, both on his blog and he's done a couple of books for Manny. He does talks all over the place. Uh, really interesting hearing his thoughts on it. And he's not a great fan of the Microsoft implementation because it's a conforming container. The idea of a conforming container is that it usually acts as an abstraction over the most commonly used features of a DI container. And therefore, it's quite limited because basically it's the lowest common denominator. And in Microsoft's case, they just did enough for what they wanted to do. In .NET Core, the abstraction is presented through the iService Provider interface. The default implementation is Microsoft's container, but you have the ability to swap out to another implementation such as Autofac. And certainly when I started playing with .NET Core, I was using Autofac and then sort of kind of realized I wasn't using anything special out of Autofac. So ditched it and just used the out the box implementation. However, 
if you want the functionality of those containers and it's not supported by the abstraction, then you have to manage both side by side, which can become a bit of an overhead. And that's kind of why I ditched AutoFAC when I was realized that I didn't need anything special from it. Well, you do get out of the box with Microsoft Container. Well, you get constructor injection and um, well, that's about it really. Um, there's other types of injections that you may need though. If you're working with ASP.NET Core, you do get to make use of method parameter injection by using the from services parameter attribute. So you can declare a method and some of the stuff, stuff might have come in in the constructor of say a controller, but what will happen is ASP.NET Core along through the MVC framework, for example, will go and resolve services that you've marked with that, um, that attribute as it goes along. There are other types of injection that aren't supported out of the box with, with it. Property injection, named and keyed registrations and convention-based registrations. The good news is hopefully by the end of this talk, I'll have shown you a few workarounds. So with that, you shouldn't necessarily need to go to another container. But if you do, here's a number of containers that Microsoft on the docs page say are compatible with the iService provider interface and implementations. If you're using .NET, sorry, if you were using .NET Core 2, you would usually wire these up during your configure services. And at the end, call a method on one of those containers to say, go and build the service provider and return it out of configure services. That all changed in Core 3 when we moved from having web hosts to generic hosts. And a lot of that all changed. So what you need to do now is go and look at the appropriate documentation for whatever other container you're using to go and find out how to do it. But they all follow a similar pattern, which I'll come on to. So in this code snippet, we have the stuff that you're likely to be familiar with, where we're just registering some classes with a container and can give them different lifetimes. As we've already covered, once registered, the build service provider extension method will be called now if this was in core two, we'd be calling it at the end here, but because I'm assuming core three or core five, that's handled by the host. Now, if you did try to return a service provider, you will actually get the, this message, this um, analyzer message, because they're actively discouraging you from doing it. What it also means is that whilst in version two, there was a small performance boost by implementing the iStartup interface, when using web host builder, that's no longer supported with the generic host. And I was having to look today at various um, things on GitHub. There was a long turn of throwing with um, David Fowler about should they, shouldn't they, and different interfaces, but it never seemed to have got resolved. If you want to use an alternative container, there is a use service provider factory extension method that you can use on the host builder. But as I say, it's probably best to go and look at the documentation. If you do go down that route, you can either call an extension method that configures the container on the host, or you can have a configure container method on your startup class where you receive the native container from the service provider that's been built. As the configuration differs from container to container, I won't go into any more detail here. But there's definitely examples on the AutoFAC documentation website and the Lamar documentation pages. So once you've got your container, you need to give some consideration to the lifetimes of instances that you want to create. Now, I'm sure that most of this is going to be familiar to you. So here we go. Singletons. These are created once and live for the duration of the container. Transients are our fair weather friends that come and go as and when needed. They're very short lived. And last but not least, scope. That sits between the two in that it lasts for the lifetime of a unit of work. And I'll be going into a bit more detail later on. Now, starting with the shortest of these lifetimes, the, the transient, and accept any of the other lifetimes being injected into it because it's a very short-lived thing. Moving up through to scoped, well, scope can take another scoped or a singleton, but you shouldn't really push a transient into it. And I'll come on to that in a minute. Lastly, singletons, it's much longer lived. 
So you shouldn't be injecting transients or scopes into that either. Now I've chosen to choose my words very carefully by saying shouldn't rather than can't. The reason for that is that there's often a misconception that it's not possible to inject incompatible lifetimes, but that's not strictly true. I can't speak for the other containers, but certainly Microsoft's container won't stop you. If you do have a singleton and require an object that has been registered as one of the other two lifetimes, the container will happily give you that instance. But the instance you get will have its lifetime locked to become the same as the receiving instance. So if you inject a transient into a singleton, for example, then effectively you've locked that transient's state as it is when the singleton got created and it's stuck there until the singleton is disposed of. That's known as a capture dependency. And a, a bit like the insect tracked in amber that I've got in the illustration next to it, it's that lock state. It can't move until in that case, the amber is cracked. Obviously the insect's dead, but that's neither here nor there. But you may be thinking, hold on, Steve. I've seen this exception before, indicating that you can't do it. Well, that's true. The exception can occur, but by default, it only happens when you're set in the development environment as set in the ASP.NET Core environment variable. This is done by some hidden magic that lives in the host builder where it goes and when it builds your service provider, what it's doing is it's going to set in the validate scopes optional parameter on service provider options to true. Now you can do that yourself and say, I want it true on all my different environments, production, staging, development, et cetera. The problem with doing that is that there is a performance hit because what's happening is every time you're creating, asking the container to create an instance for you, it's going to have to say, well, what am I going into? What am I, uh, uh, what do I do? Throw an exception. You don't really do want to do that. So there's a performance hit. So the general guidance from Microsoft is don't do that in production. So staying on the theme of lifetimes, let's take a step back a bit and look at singletons in a bit more depth. Now as a pattern, singletons have been around for a long time. And it's one of the patterns described in the so-called Gang of Four book. The main thing about singletons is like its name implies, like a Highlander, there can be only one. There's quite a difference between the traditional Gang of Four singleton and a container singleton. The way you code them is quite different. In the code snippet, you'll see that the core of the traditional singleton. As you can see, there's a static property of instance, which is how classes will retrieve the, the instance from a, the static field. Now, what you'll notice is that the creation of the instance needs to be thread safe. So it's best to wrap it in a lazy structure because that ensures that only one thread will ever go and create it. Um, I think it was John Skeet way back um, heard various things about singletons and that's where that seems to be the best way of doing it to ensure thread safety. However, for a container singleton, you can, in theory, pretty much use any POCO object. Um, you don't need all the ceremony of creating st static methods and static properties and all that. You can pretty much just use any old POCO. But the burning question is, which is better? I like the Gang of Four pattern. But containers sing singletons are much simpler. There's only one to sort it out. Right, right. Sorry, didn't Harry, Harry Hill aside. So on the left, we've got the traditional Gang of Four singleton. And as you can see, there's an awful lot of boilerplate stuff that you have to do. I'm not gonna list it out because we'll be here all evening. But basically it puts a lot of onus on the developer and there's things you can get it wrong and you've got to watch out for your thread safety. On the other hand, the implementation for the DI container is pretty lightweight. You don't have to do a, a great deal of thought, but I'll come on to that in a minute. You don't get a free lunch on it. But for my money, the container implementation of Singleton is a lot easier from a coding point of view because you're having to give it less thought and there's a lot less boilerplate. What are the typical candidates for Singletons? Well, ideally Singleton should be stateless. So a lot of the complications around threading just disappear straight away. But sometimes you may well have state to manage, such as pooled resources or in-memory queues, 
where you're in control of a limited resource and you want you want to be in full control of it you don't want people creating new instances of it left right and center you may also have what's called an ambient singleton or ambient context which hides complexity of accessing the shorter lived objects something like http context accessor in the asp.net that bridges the gap of you shouldn't be putting scoped things into singletons but by using um, async local storage, which is a bit like thread, thread storage in prior to the async world, what it does is it allows you to go through a singleton to get to some scoped context. One of the things I do in the vein of management of obtaining and caching stuff is OAuth tokens. What I'll do is I'll have an OAuth token manager inside a singleton and that manages itself and sort of says, go and get the OAuth token the first time I called. Then when it expires, it will automatically go and get another token. The outside world is completely oblivious to it. If it's abstracted through um, an interface, you just say, go and give me the current token. The last state I've got, a uh, case I've got on here, is a mutable state where you don't want to have to keep recreating the source over and over again. So this is good for things like read-only caches where you've read a dozen or so um, things from a database. You don't want to go to the database every single blimmin' time that you want to go find that, serve up that information. You just want to read it once and hold it there for the lifetime of the application. Now, obviously, they keep saying that the hardest things in computing are caches and naming, but it, it, it depends, as they say. If you really must have state in a single turn, Give some thought to letting .NET do some of the heavy lifting for you. For example, if you've got collections, consider using the concurrent collections namespace where the thread safety st stuff has been done for you. For read-only properties, make the underlying field read-only. That's more of a safety net so that if someone comes along and tries to make one of those properties read right later on, well, they'll hit compiler errors and it'll make them think twice and then they'll need to do some work to actually purposefully do that rather than just sort of saying, oh, I'm going to just change this getter to a get setter. But if you do need to make something read right in a singleton, you should be careful. What you should be doing is using a thread lock. So in this slide, we can see that we're ensuring that all property access is managed by the thread lock. So it can only be changed one thread at a time. Now, the downside to this, especially if you're on a website, is uh, that by serializing the access to the property, you'll get a performance hit. So you may want to consider using async local option that I described just a minute ago. Lastly, you need to consider the impact of having disposables in a single term. The problem here is that if you expose the dispose method and some caller that's got your, your instance out of the container happens to call dispose, well, because it's a singleton, it's died and no one else can get hold of it. So what you need to do is make sure that the, you, you abstract it away by using an interface. So in this example, I've got a class that I've called do not dispose me that implements I do something. So the do something implementation is exposed through an interface and that's the thing that we register with our container, and that's the thing that people will get. They'll get an I do something. But the dispose method is still there for the container to dispose when it's finished with the singleton, but the outside world can't call it. Well, not without a lot of key reflection anyway. So for transients, down the other end of the spectrum, there's not really a lot to say other than be careful about doing a lot of work in the constructor. Reason for that is if you're creating, you've got lots of things say on a website, calling, going, creating these instances of transients. You don't want them all going and heavily hitting the database each time they're created. If you're going to do that, try and do something in the singleton and then inject the results into your transient. By the singleton, if the class implements side disposable, try and hide the dispose method, but it, it's kind of less important for transients because they are so short lived. The other thing to think about with transients is if you can't resolve all the constructor parameters that you need for the, from the container, you might want to consider a factory and we'll come along to that in a bit. Moving on to scoped, these need to be handled with care. 
in fact, I've seen several blogs where, where some companies have said, we don't touch scoped lifetimes with a barge pole. We've already gone over interacting with other lifetimes, but what exactly is a scope? The common answer is that they are created for HTTP request response lifetimes, but that's not really the whole story. A scope is not tied to just HTTP lifetimes. You can create your own scope both outside and inside ASP.NET. For example, you can go and create a scope in a console application, a Xamarin app, um, UWP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the ones that are now supported by Core 3 and 5. A scope is really there to ensure consistency within a unit of work. So when you have several objects that all rely on that one object within the same scope, they get that one instance. Now, if you have transients, you get different ones. And if you get singleton, well, everyone gets that single one. By having that unit of work, you can say, I am interested in this thing for this lifetime. When you go outside that boundary, you get a different object. You can manually create a scope by calling the create scope method on the iService uh, provider instance. This gives you back an iService scope with a single property of service provider. That in its turn has an instance of iService provider again, but this time you've created a boundary. Last point about disposables, I've banged on about it and you'll be sick to death of me going on about it, is disposables. In ASP.NET, the creation of scopes is taken care of for you when, you when a request response lifetime is started. That scope container is carried through the pipeline for you by the HTTP context request services property. Under the bonnet, the call to create scope is handled inside the request services feature class. So you can see here, I've, I've pulled it down from, from GitHub. This is the thing that whilst ASP.NET is going through all the things of the pipeline and going creating your HTTP context, this gets injected and creates the scope at the start of that HTTP context. All this is really hidden away from you and you don't really need to care, care about it. But there is one area in ASP.NET where you do need to be aware of what's going on with scopes. Now, I'm just going to bring Zoom up just to make sure I'm still here. And everyone's still there. So that's good. That's good. I haven't been disconnected. That's good. So ASP.NET and scopes. The one area you do need to be careful of is in middleware. Now, when we talk about middleware, we generally think about handling requests and responses. And therefore, we assume that middleware is scoped. But that's not really the case. When you use the extension methods to register middleware, so the use middleware, or you might have explicit use blah, blah, blah middleware, it's actually registered as a singleton. And therefore, if you add a scoped dependency into the constructor, we're back to our captured dependency. It'll be locked there for the lifetime of the middleware singleton. That's not what we really want. If we're sort of saying we need, we've got a scope dependency, we want that per request effectively. So how does the request that has scope get dealt with? Well, as .NET moves through each layer of middleware in the pipeline, there's an invoke async, and there's also a non-async version as well. And those get called via reflection. So there's no explicit interfaces saying I invoke async has a, these number of parameters. You can add however many parameters you want in. They could be singletons, transients, or scoped. That's the bit where you get your scoping coming into your middleware. So in the slide here, I've got the don't inject here on your constructor and the do inject here on the task invoke async. You'll be sick of me talking about disposables by, by the end of this talk, but it's something that's really quite important and doesn't get a lot of coverage when talking about dependency injection. To bring it all together, First, I said about hiding disposed methods as the container will take care of it. That's true in most cases, but you do need some care if you go and create the instance yourself. If you then go and expose it through some kind of factory or directly in the registration. So here's a page from the, the DI documentation on the docs website from Microsoft. As you can see, I've highlighted them in red here. There's a couple of instances where you go and new up an implementation yourself. And what I've highlighted is the container won't go and dispose those for you. 
what's more tricky is that there's no obvious re-entry point to configure services or startup for you to go and dispose it as well. So once you've created it, it's kind of there until the application ceases. Now, for singletons, that's kind of not the end of the world, but it does get a bit tricky with scopes and um, transients. So why would you take that approach? The reason you may be creating objects in startup is to pass some arguments to the constructor, and those arguments can't be found through resolving other things in the container. If that is the case, you should be considering maybe writing a factory, and I'll come on to that in a bit. But if you really must do this, you do have a get out of jail card that I only found out a little while ago. There is an interface that automatically gets registered by the host called iHost Application Lifetime. This can be injected into the configure method of your startup by adding it to the parameter list. Here you can register a handler for the application shutdown, which is past the objects that you want to be disposed of. Now I haven't really played with, with that too much other than ju just this example that I knocked up here. So I don't, don't know the effects of having lots of different ob objects um, that you need disposing, but it's worth having in your toolkit. Going back to hiding the dispose method, if the class is not yours, so you, you haven't got an abstraction and the company that's provided or the open source that's provided it haven't given you some kind of abstraction that hides the dispose as well, then you may want to consider one of the other gang of four patterns such as facade, adapter, bridge, or proxy. These are all variations of the same thing, where you create some kind of wrapper class to handle the creation and the disposal of the class instance. The last point is a rare one, and it's the code smell. If you have a class that is what's known as a control freak and insists on disposing instances passed in because that's both by written by whoever they expect to be able to be in control of those things, what you may want to do, again, is maybe use a, a factory where you expose something with an eye disposable, but it's very short lived. So, quick breather and a, a sip of water. Let's move on to sort of trying to avoid so, some of the common gotchas with the, the eye container in .NET. What happens when the same service type gets registered multiple times against multiple implementations. So for example, I've got this iMove that does walk, jog, and run. You may well be doing this deliberately because you want to have several implementations that you want to iterate through, like validation rules, something like that. But it can happen by accident. You may have code merges that have gone wrong. So someone's changed the type and you've got the old type being registered and the new type being registered. More common situation is if you've got external extension methods registering different implementations to the one you were registering. Whatever the reason, there can be an unintended consequence because of the way the container works. Namely, it works on the last in wins principle. If you call an extension method after your registration the, and the extension method goes and registers something else, then it's the extension methods implementation that they're going to receive, not yours. Of course, if you're writing an extension method, it's up to you to try and play nicely, especially if you're publishing via NuGet and it's a public audience. As we know, there needs to be care around lifetimes and things get messy if there are multiple registrations with different lifetimes. So you may think you've registered a singleton in your code and someone comes along and trumps it with a transient or scoped, and then things get really kind of messy. Now, it may be that, as I mentioned on the previous slide, you deliberately want multiple implementations, and I'll come on to that in a minute. But when you're trying to avoid accidentally re registering things multiple times, there are two ways you can do it. The first is to use the variations of the triad methods where the first registration is kept and subsequent registrations are ignored. So flipping from a last in wins to a first in wins. The second is triad enumerable. It's pretty much doing the same thing, but this time you're locking it to the service type, which is usually an interface and the implementation type. So in the examples I've got here, due to using triad as a singleton, 
I've registered it six times, but the first entry is the thing that's going to be served up. The container registrations will ignore the other five. In the second example, I've registered the planets twice over, but it's only the first implementations that are different from one another that get served up. So we're using a container. Let's have a few suggestions to try and make the code better. Flipping what I've just been talking about on its head, as I say, there may be situations where you deliberately want to register multiple implementations and you get the callers to iterate over them. As I said earlier, a common situation is with multiple validation rules. You may have an I validate rule and just pass them all in and then your caller iterates over them. That's not really a great way of doing it, but it's a very simplistic example to try and get my point over. However, the consuming class does need to know that there are multiple registrations. And to do that, it must explicitly request an I enumerable of the service type to get all those implementations. If it doesn't do that, it's only going to get the single instance, be it the first in wind if you've done a triad or the last in wind if you've just done a regular ad. If the order of the enumerable is important, then that, there needs to be a way to differentiate each instance. Without that, the consumer will have to rely on the order that the registrations were performed. That's the default that the container will serve them up as. There are lots of ways of handling that. You could create a comparer implementation based on the I comparable. And then when the caller receives the I enumerable, it can use link and the order by and use that comparer to do the sorting. You could create a dedicated class that implements I enumerable interface. And inside that class, you control the ordering either by using a comparer or you might be using the yield statement. So yield return A, B, C, D, et cetera. You could take a similar approach without having to create a class by you doing that inside a Lambda expression. And that serves up the instances in the required order. Going the other way around, we've said about having lots of instances of an interface, sorry, implementations of an interface. What if you've got a single class that's got lots of different interfaces? That's quite common if you use the solid principles and use the interface segregation principle where you've got lots of tiny little interfaces all, all, all um, working off of one class. If you register the type with each interface individually, each registration is going to create its own distinct instance. That's not kind of the end of the world if they're transients, but if they're scoped or singleton, as, as we said, um, we want that single instance. If you want that same instance coming through the different interfaces, you've got to register the instance first as its class type. But then what you do is to register those other interfaces. You can use Lambda expressions that use the get required service method to resolve the main instance from the container. And then you can return it via the interface. So in my example, I've got these three where I'm going you know, on different interfaces, one, two, and three, but they're all pulling in the one thing. In some cases, you may want to aggregate the interfaces together into a composite interface as, as I've got shown here. Um, this may be a benefit if you don't want consumers to be able to request the main implementation. So we were sort of saying that you register the type, but if you don't want that type exposed, maybe because it's an eye disposable, for example, you abstract it away into an interface and make that the aggregate that can get served up. Hopefully, well, I say hopefully, probably no one will actually go and use that aggregate interface. But then again, they might decide to do that if they want all those different interfaces rather than requesting each interface separately. That's where you get a bit of conflict with the interface segregation principle. Next, we have open generics where you define a type parameter on the type class, such as list. So we got list T, for example. Now, the place you may be familiar with this from a DI perspective is the I logger T interface, where you may be using it in your controller constructors, for example, to get an I logger, and you specify the type of your controller so that when it logs, it says, I've been logged from this controller. Similarly, you may be familiar with the I options interface that gets registered when you use configure methods to bind configuration to objects. That was the subject of my talk back in April, so I won't go back into detail now. 
if you want to register your own open generic type, the C sharp syntax does lend, doesn't really lend itself because you can't refer to an open generic within a generic. So instead, we have to use non generic registration methods where we use the type of keyword to get the class type without having the type parameter. So in the case here, I've got I list and list, and you'll see they're shown with angle brackets, but no mention of T or any particular type. Behind the scenes, the container makes use of the type make it generic type method. And what that does is that, that goes and creates the closed type. So if you ask for an I list of string, it will go and create a list of strings. And then it will return that instance. Now, this is why I say the list example doesn't really hold water because what strings would you go and create? What you'd really do is this is more helper functions, a bit like the loggers, some sort of um, cross cutting thing where you're kind of interested in a, a type, generic type, but you're not doing anything very specific with it. But at the moment, there's a problem if your type definition includes a generic constraint on it. What will happen is it will throw an exception. But this is where a friend of .NET Southwest, Jimmy Bogard, comes to the rescue. He did a pull request that just added a try catch and allowed a constrained generic to be resolved, as there was a problem with the way he was trying to do it. But it took four years for that pull request to be accepted by Microsoft, and it's finally in .NET 5. If you read Jimmy's blog, and I've got the URL there, you'll see that the reason behind that and the reason why there's been very little change in the Microsoft container since the first version of .NET Core. In short, you have to ensure that all those other container technologies that I mentioned at the start of the talk, your AutoFax, your Ninjax, all, all those, because they're working with the iService provider, you have to make sure that they don't break, which in turn, means you've got to write lots and lots of unit tests that show that not only does your change fix something as Jimmy's did, or bring something worthwhile to the container, you also have to prove that that change doesn't break. So you've got to have examples in all the different container technologies that are supported by iService provider. Water. Next, I want to talk about a couple of old school patterns that are relevant in the DI container world. I've, I've prattled on about it several times, but the first is the factory pattern. Now, you may be thinking, Steve, surely the point of a container is to be the factory. So why would I want to write a factory class that goes within the DI container? Sometimes you have to give the DI container a helping hand. For example, some of the constructor parameters for a class may not be known until runtime. They may be captured from, say, user input, or they come from JSON in a microservice, something like that. In those cases, you can't create the instance directly from the container because you've got some parameters that you don't know. It may be that the instance has to be created and it needs to be disposed of quickly. So we've talked about tran transients that are disposal. But if you've got something where you've got some parameters going into it, you can't rely on that. So you end up with this a factory where you can say, well, I'll take some of my information from the container and some of my information from the user input. This is where the factory comes into its own. Now, usually you'd register a factory as a singleton, as most of the time you'll be dependent on other singletons coming into it. Then you, the bits you don't know, you take in the method saying create, for example. However, if you don't want callers to have to traverse and go and get stuff out the container on route, you just need something like transients you could take the iService provider directly from in your constructor. But proceed with caution on that. Direct use of the iService provider is seen as a service locator anti-pattern. Reason it's an anti-pattern is that it's a tight coupling to the container interfaces, which in most cases you don't really want to do because the whole point of containers is to try and loosen up this whole coupling so you can do substitutions, et cetera. Ideally, you want your classes to be oblivious to the container. However, the factory pattern classes fall into a group that I refer to as servicing classes. They're plugging gaps in the container functionality that are effectively an extension of the container. So with that in mind, I think as long as the factory classes are seen in that context, I'm 
fairly relaxed about it. I know it's an anti-pattern, but sometimes you have to be pragmatic rather than dogmatic. If you're worried about that tight coupling being exposed to coolers, then what you can do is you can abstract it with an interface and then just expose that interface out to the outside world. So I widget factory, just as a method of create, how that factory gets created, well, the outside world's not aware of it. If you make it pri private class within your startup and register it within the startup, then the outside world is completely oblivious to it. A variation of the factory pattern is the builder pattern, whereby rather than prescribing which dependencies are needed upfront and creating the instances immediately, the builder is much more flexible. Think of the two like ordering drinks at fast food restaurants. The factory is like asking the person just to serve you a cola. They have a standardized dispenser like on the left with a fixed set of options of Pepsi Max and Pepsi Diet Pepsi and so on in this. I've got no affiliation to Pepsi by the way, nor Coke or it, unless anyone wants to give me lots of free samples, but anyway. With the builder, it's much more like the modern dispensers you see on the right where you can say, I want a cola with a dash of lime flavoring, a bit of vanilla, some cherry, gradually composing up bit by bit until you've got the final drink that you want. And with that combination, it sounds absolutely disgusting, but on your head be it. So with the builder, we start much like the factory by registering it with a container, usually as a singleton. In its constructor, we take in other singletons or the eye service provider, depending on whether we need to get transients on the fly. Consuming classes then take the builder as a construction parameter into them. So you may have something like I configuration builder is, is one that you often see in OSP.net. You start with methods and properties to build up the new instance by sort of saying, I want to add some vanilla, I want to add some cherry, I want to add some lime, etc. Once we've got it configured exactly as we want it, you'll usually have a method called build, and that will give you your final instance. Like the factory, if the instance you create is disposable, it's the caller's responsibility to call that dispose method or wrap it in a using statement. Now, so far, we've kind of assumed that the factory or builder will be using the new keyword to instantiate classes. It's not using the container to do any heavy lifting. But it'd be not nice to get away from this whole new is glue thing if we could get the container to do some of the heavy lifting for us because it's already got a load of them registered. We don't want to have to keep calling I service provider all the time. How do we get the parameters from the container? Well, we could use I service provider, but we're told that's an anti-pattern. This is where the activator utilities class comes in. What it does is it takes an instance of I service provider, which you can get injected into your factory. Now, if you've only got one or two parameters, well, you could just use that. But sometimes things get a bit more complicated. You might be wanting a class that's got about six or seven different constructor parameters, some of which will be coming from the container, some of which will be coming from user input, and some of them you might be calculating. So you might have a calculate price based on a quantity and a price. So the quantity is coming from um, your user input and the prices come from say a, a repository instance, for example. This can be useful when you want to do that. What it'll do is it'll take a whole load of objects and just mash them all together and find the contract that fits nearest. Another place where factories or builders can be useful is if you get a value, if you want to get a value type from the container. Now, the reason for this is that you simply can't register a value type with the DI container, it's not supported. So I've got a struct of my type value type there with first name and last name, trying to add a transient and I get an analyzer error saying, you just can't do that. And in that example, there wouldn't be much point because where would it get first name and last name from? You may be smart and think, ah, it's something to do with generics. I can't do it because of generics and just use the non-generic version of our transient. All you're doing is moving the problem down the road to runtime instead of compile time. You're just not allowed to do it. Again, this is where our friend the factory comes in. 
what you can do, and this is a contrived example, I admit, because I've only used in first name and last name and I'm not really pulling anything in from the container. But if you desperately need to get a value type out of the container by using the factory, you can say, okay, I'll go and register this factory in my container and I'll get the factory and consume the factory in my caller classes and then call create from inside there. Which kind of leads us to the new C-sharp nine record types. Now I'm not gonna go into detail because I'm sort of running a bit short on time now, um, but basically they're reference types. It's a bit like classes, but they behave like value types. And because they're reference types like classes, you can register them with a container. So moving forward, if you desperately have a need to be able to create value types out of the container, well, maybe records is the way to go. However, given the, the idea of record types is there sort of value types in domain driven domain parlance, you mainly using them for sort of value entities and you don't really want to get those coming out of the container. So again, this is where the factory pattern comes in for the same reasons I gave on the previous slide about va value types. If you're interested in finding out more about records, um, really good 20 minute or so episode of on.net that's available on channel nine. And I've got a link there. Based on that, I've written a blog post at the beginning of this week about creating C-sharp nine record factories. And it covers quite a few bases of what I've done in this talk, all within one example, this GitHub repo that covers it as well. Next we have something no one really talks about with dependency injection. We nearly always talk about classes and interfaces being registered with the container, but delegates are a first class citizen as well, and you can register them. Now, in theory, you could register the anonymous delegates of func t, but that's really hard to do because how do you distinguish one from another? That's where we go really old school, back to .NET 1.0 and create custom delegates. Now I've written another blog post a few months ago about, about this, but as a quick example, I hate system date time now with a vengeance. I, I really don't like that static property being in my code base, left, right and center. It's very hard to unit test and it's because it's non-deterministic. Wouldn't it be nice if we could wrap that date time functionality? Now, in the past, I've written interfaces and abstractions and then so, so I've had a, a real, real version that goes off and has get UTC time, get current date time, get current date and all those. But if, if the only thing I'm interested in is say date time now or UTC now, I've only got the one thing. Instead of having to write an interface and write a class implementation and register it all, it'd be quite nice if I could just say, I've got a function that goes and gets me the current date time. That's it. And that's what I've got here. So at, at the top of the example, you can see I've got public delegate date time, doesn't take any parameters, just get current UTC date time. And then I add a transient, though in theory, and, and I think I'm right in saying this, you could register it as a singleton because all you're registering is the pointer to the function, not the results of the function. You then declare a Lambda that goes and does that for you. So I've got a blog post there which goes into a lot of detail and examples. From a unit tester point of view, this gets you get rid of this nasty static date time now in your code base. You just have that function. And therefore you can mock that function. So win-win. That's enough about patterns for the, for the Sorry, that's enough about patterns. What about those features that aren't supported in the conforming container? A feature that's supported by other containers such as Autofac is being able to specify a particular instance of the container based a name on a key or a key. Now it's considered a bit of an anti-pattern because again, you might be locking into a particular container technology. But I had a scenario last year where I had a type of data adapter class that was determined at runtime based on a value returned from the database. 
So I pondered on it and the, the nasty way of writing is massive, great big switch statement that sort of says, if it's this, go and get one of these and so on, so on, so on, so on. And I tried things with dictionaries and, and heard a bit of a mess. And then I had a sort of bit of a brainwave and thought, well, if I could just pass in a key through a parameter to a function or a delegate and get that to do the heavy lifting, then win-win. So it's a bit long-winded to describe here, and there's a link to my blog post, but to give you an idea of what's involved, I've got this example. So I created a common interface of iKelvin mapper, and I've got several variations of centigrade to Kelvin, Fahrenheit to Kelvin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I then did was re registered each of them as singletons because they're, they're stateless, they're just a function. And then I had my delegate of Kelvin converter mapper. That would take a single string and ba based on that string, I've got a switch statement there that returns the appropriate one. So C for centigrade, F for Fahrenheit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if um, it didn't find one, it would just return null. I can then have another class get temperatures. It gets the Kelvin converter mapper. So our, our delegate function pushed into it. And then it has a method get temperature where I pass in the string by, by C, F, K, um, or whatever the other one I was, I can't remember. That then passes that into the mapper and calls the appropriate the two Kelvins with a particular temperature and Bob's your uncle. The decorator is another gang of four pattern that can be used to extend functionality of a class by wrapping it and then re-implementing all the members. But where necessary, intercepting the incoming parameters and outgoing to do something. A common example of this is to add a logger so that every call come, coming in gets logged and every call, every result going out gets logged. This requires the original class to be injected into the decorator along with, in this case, the logger. Oh, oh, ah, I've, got, I've got animations on here. So I've got an interface, I do something, get hello message. I've got an implementation, do something, which just returns hello, whatever you've passed into it. Then I've got my decorating class where I also take, where I take the original do something and I take in a logger using my generics to do something. And then before I call the underlying do something, I log what the name was received. And then when it comes out, I log the outgoing message as well. So that decoration allows you to add functionality to classes without actually having to change the underlying source code. So back to sort of solid principles, open for extensibility, except it, it, there's, there's way, ways you can go, go around that. One of the last things I want to talk about is one of the features of DI containers is registration of services by convention and assembly scanning. I'm personally not a big fan of do, doing this because I'm a bit of a control freak. Um, I like to know exactly what I'm registering, how I'm registering it, and I, 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 I want to see the code. But I totally get it. If you've got 100 classes sitting in a, in a project that you need to register, you don't want to go and hand crank those 100 registrations. What a scanner will do is it will go, you can define various patterns about does it adhere to this interface? How do I want to, how do I want to register it? Now, there, there's various implementations and Scruter is probably the, the most popular one. Um, but John P. Smith, who wrote Entity Framework Core in Action, also has got his own one. And I know there's various solutions out there. If you're using a third party container, many of those support the scanning as well. One thing I do like about Scruter, though, is we just talked about decorating classes. And it's got methods where you can basically say, go and register. Here's in one line, here's the thing that I'm registering and I'm going to decorate it with this other thing. And it makes the syntax a lot simpler. When I gave this pro a previous version of this talk, um, 
so, someone who, who came along referred to Nicolas Law of DI. And I, I never heard of it, but he sort of sent me the link in chat when I heard a look at it. And it's quite an old post, but in short, these are the basic things to consider with dependency injection. The first one is not to create entities from the container, just register services. And this is, comes back to the whole thing about factory patterns, builders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think there are a few exceptions to that. We talked about having singletons that have cached data. You could argue they're entities, but generally you wouldn't, you would go and create your data entities in your own code. The rest of the things it talks about are mainly to do with solid principles. So the links there, I've put it in chat before we started. Um, I highly recommend going and have a look. And finally, the last topic is a brief mention about performance. Some of your registered classes may take a while to be instantiated. So for example, say you've got repository um, classes that go off and talk to databases and to other microservices. There might be a bit of a, a startup time involved in those where it goes and creates connection pools, things like that. If that is the case, you may want to consider having some sort of background hosted service that starts up with the application. And then what it does is it goes and looks at your service collection and says, all these things I've registered, go and try and create an instance of them. What that does is for singletons, it means it's gone and created it before, before say your website starts running um, and it's ready to run on that first real call that comes in. Transparency and scoped, well, it's going to create them and throw them away. But what you do benefit from is the JIT compilation. So next time they're called, you don't have to go through that whole JIT compilation process. Andrew Locke's written a really good blog post about it. Um, I think there's several ways of skinning that cat, but certainly his is a good one. And that just about wraps it up from me. Um, thank you all for listening to me. I um, hope you've provided some value. Um, rattle through it, starting to lose my voice a, a bit. Um, hopefully you've got one or two gold nuggets of things that you weren't aware of before. Um, if you want to hear any more of my ramblings, I'm on Twitter quite a bit at Steve Talks Code. Um, I'm a bit ha haphazard about blogs. I, they're like buses. I won't write anything for a long time and then I'll write two or three on a go. Um, a few honorable mentions. I've, I've mentioned Andrew Locke's blog website. Um, he's also got a new version of the ASP.NET Core in Action book. Um, I think it's chapter 10 in the new version. There's a chapter about dependency injection and there's quite a few things I've touched on today that's in that. The Microsoft Docs, now I've got the URL to the Core 3 version. Obviously, I think that, that'll be updated in the next couple of weeks. I think there's already preview versions of Core 5, sorry, .NET 5, I should say. Um, and lastly, I've made reference to Mark Siemens talks before. Um, he's got a lot of really good stuff on his blog. And another Manning book, obviously Manning have got the uh, corner on these things. Um, Dependency Injection Principle Practices and Patterns. Quite an interesting book. What they do is the first few chapters talk about patterns, anti-patterns, stuff like that. And then it goes through quite a lot of the common open source implementations. And I think it's one of the final chapters is about the Microsoft one. It was written around core one, core 2.1 time. So it might be a little bit out of date. Um, whether there's a new version upcoming, not sure. Um, but basically that is it from me.